Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I am so excited for our conversation today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lori LeBay, the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. My mother had dementia for 30 years, so I switched careers to try to raise everyone's voice so that they could get the resources they needed because I didn't feel that they were there for me. Alzheimer's Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. And we do that again by raising everyone's voice and sharing um, all the cool resources that are out there. And today when I say cool, you're going to really see cool um, and fun. And uh, you're going to be filled with hope after this discussion. We also, as a company, help companies expand their brand footprint by leveraging our content. Not only do we have the radio show, but we do these video interviews. We do something called Dementia Chats, where I interview the experts who truly are the experts. They're living and breathing and walking uh, with dementia every single day. They're those that are diagnosed. We also have a resource website, YouTube channels, um, do speaking and training and so much more. But I want to thank each and every one of you. You see, our listeners, you guys are fabulous. You have helped elevate our voice and helped us get uh, expand our reach. And so I can't thank you enough for that because so many people are in need of getting these additional resources and having choice in terms of how are they going to live with dementia. And so you've gotten us recognized by Oprah, Maria Shriver, Dr. Oz, and Share Care, and so many others. And um, we couldn't have done that without you. I'm a one person show here just trying to push the needle forward. And I thank you for being part of our tribe here. I'd also want to um, ask you to think about being our next guest because we, again, listen to everyone's voice those who are diagnosed with dementia, those who are walking alongside it, supporting people with dementia, researchers, um, communities, authors, movie directors, singers, songwriters, advocates, you name it, we want to hear from you. So just go to alzheimerspeaks.com and reach out to me. Now, before I introduce these two lovely ladies, I always like to give a shout out to a couple other companies that I just adore. And the first one I want to mention is the Roberto app. The Roberto app is really a cool concept. You can, you can download it. You can actually get an um, extended free trial if you go to alzheimerspeaks.com and just push on their banner ad. It's a video interaction that you do that measures your brain function. And you can do it as often as you want. They're bringing it into schools and doing challenges. They're bringing it into businesses to help for team building. But, you know, it can really help us recognize a lot of times we might be worried that we've got signs of dementia, but a lot of those, a lot of those things that are happening with us are controllable. Maybe we're not drinking enough fluids. Maybe we're not getting enough sleep. Maybe we're just way too stressed. And this will help you identify some of those things. And, and if you are really in a decline, then this is a perfect tool to also bring into your doctor and show them what is happening because it measures different portions of your brain. So check out the Roberto app. It's very, very cool. I also like to give a shout out to the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. They take a holistic approach. So if you're looking for diet, exercise, and meditation, head there. If you're looking for information on women's Alzheimer's um, research, Check out Maria Shriver's uh, Women's Alzheimer's Movement and Move for the Mind. She just did her Move for the Minds this uh, June and has fabulous panel guests on. Uh, she did it in four different locations, so it took place in many locations um, within the U.S. and the U.K. Um, but you can go to the Women's Alzheimer's Movement dot, dot org to learn more about that. 
So with no further ado, I have to introduce our friends here. I have been lucky enough to meet these two ladies when they came to Minnesota and they are coming back to Minnesota in August and it's like, woohoo, I, I can't wait to see them. And um, I'm going to attend one of their training classes. We have Kathy Braxton, who is the Chief Education Officer of Silver Dawn Training Institute, and Tammy Newman, who is the Chief Operations Officer, and they co-created Dementia Raw, which is a really cool method on how to live graciously with dementia and, and have fun and just have a new understanding for it. Collectively, they have over 40 years of experience in long-term care and the aging industry. So welcome, ladies. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having us. Thank well, you, Lori. I, I am really excited to have you. Uh, I, Like I said, I got to meet you guys, what's that, been a couple of years ago now? And I was yep. just so impressed with you and my daughter actually went to one of your sessions and she's like mom you have to meet these ladies i'm like i just had dinner with them <laughs> she's like you know them and i'm like yeah i do honey <laughs> they're doing cool stuff so we're gonna start out today uh, i always ask all my all my guests this first question and that is have you been personally touched by dementia either by family or friends um and tammy i'll have you start if you don't mind Sure. You know, the, the amazing thing is personally, I have not been touched by dementia. I, there's no one in my family. I don't have friends except for just, just recently, my best friend's father has been um, diagnosed with vascular dementia. So, and that's just recent in the past three months that that has happened. But prior to it, it's been, you know, I, I spent about 25 years in this industry. So, I, I was with residents day in and day out with dementia. So that, that's how I've been touched with the disease. Okay, so it's not that you don't have friends, you just didn't have friends that were touched by dementia. Just right. to by that, right. she's really a cool gal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, how about you? So my, uh, I have grandparents on both sides of my family that have had some form of dementia. Um, my grandmother right now is living with Alzheimer's disease. Um, my grandfather on the other side, um, we never got a definitive diagnosis. He had a form of dementia. We don't know what kind, um, probably something along the lines of vascular because there's a lot of cardiac issues on that side of the family. Um, and myself, I have mild cognitive impairment. So oh, I, yes, I know Kathy. Yes, yeah, she has a friend. <laughs> she actually does have a friend. Um, I have mild cognitive impairment because I was in two uh, traumatic brain injury. I had two accidents uh, back to back that caused traumatic brain injury. So um, Tammy is going to recorrect herself and definitely say she lives and breathes this every I do day. every day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, with me. Um, Kathy, can you tell me about um, the CDCS program and why it's important and, and exactly what is it? Sure. So the CDCS is the acronym for the Certified Dementia Communication Specialist Program. So it's a designation. It's an individual designation. And what it encompasses basically is our eight fundamentals that is our dementia raw method. And that includes the four pillars of empathy and then four basic rules of improv that we have whittled down. And then as Tammy will say, was mis we have massaged out to be imperative rules to live with every single day. And so what we do for a CDCS is we run our students through the uh, gamut of immersing themselves in the concepts of empathy and not just gathering the concepts on an intellectual basis, but we ask and we actually encourage for them to become incredibly introspective. So there are things, there are activities they have to do prior to even coming to class that have them go out into the community and try things on and be incredibly introspective about experiences they're having, um, feedback that they're getting, and what that's causing them to feel like on the inside. Then we take those concepts and we transfer those empathy pieces into improv and these four rules of improv that we don't ask you to become a comedian. We don't think that you need to stand up and be someone that can do a second city skit, 
what we say is these four rules of improv are beautiful, simplistic mantras that you can put into communication every single day. And they become heightened because you've taken the steps of the empathy pieces and stepped into stuff yourself. So it's a very introspective approach. Um, we call it introspective improv. Um, and what you walk away from after you have the CDCS is you have that designation and you are essentially a yes person. Because for us, we feel that every community, every household, anybody who is working and living with somebody who's living with dementia, there needs to be a designated person who knows how to yes the situation, be in that moment and have those communication techniques like on the back of their hand. And so that's what you become as a CDCS is that designated yes person. Wonderful. Tammy, anything you want to add to that? She explained it really, 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 really well. I think the only thing that I want to, sh to share about this is sometimes people get the feeling that when we talk improv, and, and yes, improv is a ton of fun, um, they may become scared that they have to become this comedian. And I want to say that that's not the case. Because how improv was created was created by this woman named Viola Spolin. And Viola Spolin was working with theater games in a way to connect people. And she really was immersed in this concept of play and how play is so important in our lives, whether we're an adult or a child. So what she was doing is she was creating new ways to communicate using theater games. And also what happened is she worked with a community of people in the Chicago area that were coming in in all different languages and helping them to connect without knowing each other's language. So it's improv at its very organic beginnings is all about communication and connection. So wow. that's, that's all I want to add. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm going to throw this next question to you too, Tammy. And what, what inspired the two of you to create this training? There had to be some button that, that got pushed. Well, you know, I think there's, I think there's a lot of different, a, a lot of different things when it comes to, to what created this. Um, I, I think one of the things that did happen with this part of the beginnings of this, um, I was actually watching my son take improv classes. And as I was watching him take improv classes, I was, you know, I, I've been in this industry for so long. I filter everything through the eyes of seniors in dementia, right? And while he was taking this, this class and learning all these really cool things, I started to think about, oh my gosh, if I had this, I could explain to my families that I worked with on a day-to-day -day basis more simply and easier how to communicate with their loved ones. And I mean, my mind just kind of went, was blown at that moment in time. So, you know, I, I talked with his... Um, with his uh, improv teacher and I'm like, oh my God, this is what I'm seeing. And he's like, well, you have to take improv and you have to create this. And I am <laughs> so glad that he forced me to do that. And it was, it, it was amazing to see that. But I think what happened is we saw how wonderful that was, but we also saw the need for empathy. And I think we've also seen the need, as Kathy and I have been in this industry for so long, is that when I started out in this industry 25 years ago, and when I go into communities now, there's still not as much change as I think we should have gone through over 25 years. You know, I started out with the, um, I started out with reality orientation. And underneath this purple hair, it's all gray hair, and it's because of reality orientation, right? So, you know, it's, but we still have, there's people still doing reality orientation out there 25 years later, and we know it doesn't work, right? It caused my blood pressure to raise. It caused me to get all gray hairs. So what is the different way we can do this? So I think that's where we're hoping that this is going to be able to help people to simplify it, let's simplify what's happening. Let's make your job easier as a caregiver. And if you can infuse some fun into this to stamp those memories of what these rules are, then let's do that too. I hope that answered your question. Not passionate. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I, I, I love I love your answer because you are passionate. And it's to me, it's all about getting out of corrective care to compassionate care. Mm. You can hear it right or wrong, you know, and it's not a it, get that out of the equation. You know, that's what's gotten, I think, our world into so much trouble is trying to feel like we're one up on somebody instead of leveling the, tr the playing field. Kathy, how about you? What would you like to add? Anything? Um, I would say, I mean, Tammy definitely brought that improv piece in. I think what was interesting is it was, it, everything just kind of hit at a point for us in a very interesting way. Before we partnered up for this organization, um, I, was a, I was a guest host on Tammy's podcast. And one of the things we talked about that I was very passionate about was how can we start to engage children, kids, into the caregiving process? And so I had put some things together and I was trying to create a consulting program where I could educate children. And it was interesting because at the moment that we were talking on her podcast about how things need to be, education needs to be simplified, communication techniques to be profound but simple, and specifically inclusive with children, it was amazing how then Tammy's like, you know what, improv is the piece that we've got and this is the generation and this is the the group of people that really are underserved. And so it was an amazing click for us to realize that improv and empathy make communication accessible regardless of age. And then from that point on, we just grew and, and, and massaged this out into becoming something that is easy and attainable regardless of age or education. Um, you shouldn't feel like you have to have a master's or have read 150 books on dementia care to be able to be successful in communication. And the way things are changing now and the prices that, 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 that things cost out in the world, we are going to have more and more older adults living with their families or you know, we're going to be the caregivers and care partners walking into mom and dad's house, help it, helping as much as possible. We cannot, we cannot keep the kids out of that. And so for us, you know, that's true continuity of care when you have an entire family that can speak on the same language. Well, and I love that idea because, uh, you know, when, when my mom had this and, you know, this is over 35 years ago now, um, almost probably 40 because she's been gone for and had it 30 and, and uh, when we started seeing the signs and it was, it was kind of that, you know, well, this is, this is kind of the family secret, you know, we're not going to tell anybody else. And so it was just, it was really me and my dad and my brothers really didn't even know that much, even though we were older, we were all out of school, um, just barely, but um, that was still even limited within our nucleus, you know, within the family. And, and I would go out to um, schools and do some educating and, what I found was kids really wanted to help. Kids felt the difference, but didn't know why. And under this premise of we're, we're going to protect them, they don't need to know. And yet they've got this bundle of energy and they care and they want to help. And we're, we're telling them, no, you can't. Right. Yeah. And in this day and age right now, the kids that are growing up are much more inclusive than ever before. Yep. So we're withholding an opportunity away from them if we don't give them the tools that they can use and, and access them and use them in everyday life. And it's interesting because that's where our name, Silver Dawn, has come from, was we wanted to shift the paradigm that there was this silver tsunami that that's talked about a lot. But that, that just that language itself sets up a very negative, fearful tone and what the silver tsunami, I think, encompasses in a lot of ways is the adult child's going to take care of mom, mom or dad have dementia, and we've got these kids in the middle that are being left out. And yeah. so for us, we wanted to rephrase that and say it's a silver dawn. It's an opportunity. Yeah. Well, and the kids, they feel the family dynamics change. They know there's less attention on them. They, I mean, it's all switched. And so there's this, there's this overlapping stress and discomfort from the lack of secrecy that's um, so uncomfortable for everybody. And yet the kids are really noticing it more than the adults because the adults are like running around crazy trying to do everything and, you know, putting on the, the separate wife smile going, everything's, everything's fine. <laughs> 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 you know, honey, <laughs> you know, right. 
inside they're ready to crack. And so we need to work as a team. And, and I, I love I love that. Um, now, uh, Kathy, I'm going to throw this one to you first. What are some of the common myths that you want to dispel during the course? We had talked about, you know, you don't have to become a comedian as, as being one of the biggest ones. Because I think people see improv and they're like, oh, you know, and, and this this isn't funny, you know. Dementia's not funny. Alzheimer's not funny. I don't want to come out slinging stuff. Um, I can see that being a myth. What are, what are some others? Um, I know. I mean, in our course, we definitely, I think, tried to dispel a couple myths. I'm going to jump on mine. I'm going to let Tammy take take hers. Um, one of I don't the, know what mine is, so well, I'll let you first. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that we really like to talk about, we do dig in very deeply, is this concept of sleep. So as much as we don't talk about or cover um, the biology and the neurology of dementia and the brain, because we feel like there's other experts that do that really, really well, you can still attain and utilize the skills that we give you without any knowledge of that at all. I mean, we've tested this, this, these theories and this practice on kids as young as nine, and they can attain these skills and start using them in the world right away. So knowing the anatomy of the brain, what's happening with dementia is a wonderful thing to have, not necessary to make a great connection in the moment. So one of the, the myths that we dispel in our course is this talk about sleep. And um, Tammy has, has lots of experience with this working with the older adults in the industry where they were very highly educated and seeing more and more highly educated adults coming into long-term care with, with some form of dementia. And with the research that we've done, we found that, you know, sleep is starting to become one of the number one risk factors for a, a dementia, specifically also the lack of sleep, yeah. lack of sleep. Thank yeah. you. Thank <laughs> you. And also what we've done is we've uncovered that, you know, when we don't flush out our systems at night with full sleep and an older adult absolutely does not get the same type and quality and quantity of rest that we get, they are not able to flush their system out the way we can. That builds up over the waking hours. And so what we have found is a huge correlation between the lack of sleep and productive, good sleep through all of the stages and the behaviors that people like to term in regards to sundowning. And so for us, we really, when we sit into our CDCS class and really go through this and have open dialogue with the students, we talk about what is their experience with sleep? What are they seeing in their communities? What are they seeing with their loved ones? And it really opens up their eyes to realize that there may be um, a very simple solution to what we see as sundowning. And that is because it's related to sleep deprivation. Now can we start to make changes into someone's daily lifestyle and start to eliminate some of the actions that someone takes that shows that they're aggressive or, or anxious at that time of day. So we try to dispel the myth of sundowning by talking about it becoming and possibly being sleep deprivation. Okay, great. Tammy, anything you want to add? I, I think she covered it. And I think we talked about <laughs> the improv piece. That's probably my mind. And let's Kathy, do you have something else for me to share? Well, what is the term that we use regarding when we don't use the words behaviors? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't gotten a lot of sleep. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we, we talk about the other thing that we talk about, we used to talk about the concept of behaviors. It's a word that we no longer use. We use it in trying to explain the concept that we talk about and the concept that we use or the phrase that we use is called reasonable reaction. So really what that means is that, and I'm going to go into an improv rule for just a moment. We believe that every piece of, communication that a person with dementia shares with us. So whether it's a reaction, maybe it's a re reaction we don't like, but it's a reaction. Maybe it's, you know, verbally their body, all this, everything that goes into communication for that person with dementia is a gift back to us. That gift is then something for us to understand what has gone wrong, right? So, and if you look, and I, I, I could almost guarantee 99% of the time, Every reaction that you see from a person with dementia, whether you feel it's negative or not, is actually a reasonable reaction. And what we mean by that is there's something that precipitated that that gives reason for that reaction. 
So one of, I'm just gonna give a quick example of what this, this means. I worked with a resident in a memory care community and um, she was someone that she walked. So prior to her coming into the community, she walked like five miles a day. In the community, it was secured. We had a great little like area that was a square box and she would walk this, this all day long. So staff said, hey, Tammy, we're having a tough time getting her to come to, to lunch, to, to her meals. So what I observed was they'd go and just grab her out of that walk. Okay, let's think about this. If I'm on the streets of Chicago, some strange person comes and grabs me on the streets of Chicago, what am I going to do? I am going to beat them with my purse, right? That's a reasonable reaction. Someone I don't know grabbing me in a strange place, I'm going to reasonably react by bashing them over the head with my purse, right? That's a reasonable reaction. So her reaction was in response to her not knowing who that person was, taking her out of an activity that she was highly engaged in, and her reaction was to say, no, get away. Now, when I got into the situation, I would go and I'd start walking with her. I'd join her on her walk, we'd have a conversation, we'd pass by the kitchen, I'd be hungry, I'd smell this, you smell, oh, me, I'm so hungry, you know, I'd get that going. And this, this process took me maybe five minutes to do. And then by that time that I got her slowed down, because I would just slow the pace ever so gently as we're walking, and then I would say, hey, do you want to go eat? And she said, yes. So I had to meet her there, and we talk about that with our rule of yes and, but I think we need to stop using the word behaviors. Once again, this concept of, of words having negative connotations, and it makes us now think that they're the bad guy, if that makes sense. And, and if we look at everything as a reasonable reaction, that makes us to become introspective of ourselves. What have I done? What have I said? Is the environment causing something. So we, we look at everything that is given to us from the person with dementia as a reasonable reaction. See, I, I love that. I, I use the word triggers, reaction, and um, signals, you know, to get people to put kind of their investigative hat that they're yeah. trying to tell us something, they're communicating something, and it might not make sense to us. I also use the equation, because I think we all use the same equation, and so often people think, the people with dementia are different. But I think we all use the same equation for reaction, and that's our current attitude plus our past experiences creates our perceptions, and our perceptions then trigger our reactions. And so if we can step back and go, okay, what might this mean? How can we change this? Because a lot of that stuff, like you said, you can alleviate or you can you can integrate it differently. Yes. Uh, you know, so that it's, it's comfortable. You can change, like you said, change the pace and, and get somebody situated. I was at a, a nursing home one time and there was a, a little, uh, oh gosh, she was just adorable. She was this little Asian lady and they, the staff was really struggling with her because she, every mealtime, she would go around and take all the silverware off the tables and all the napkins. And they would get so mad because they just set everything up. And so she got really, really upset because her and the staff were kind of getting into this friction. So she would get up and she wouldn't eat. And every meal, this was a problem. She, they would get in this, this fight, kind of almost a fisticuffs, you know, not physically, but I mean, it was just like, was so uncomfortable to watch. So I, I got up and I walked down and I followed this little lady and she didn't speak a word of English. And I just walked with her and then, um, you know, we were just smiling and I ended up holding her hand and we were, we were just kind of walking. And it came to me that maybe she's really trying to do something with this silverware, trying to help because she's just, just this sweet soul, just this sweet soul. And she could get a few, few words of English out, but not much. And so I, I came back and um, had her sit down and they're like, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, I wasn't angry with her, so she wants to be here. <laughs> it was just, but we forget that they're reading all of our nonverbals and stuff. And I said, you know, why don't you ask the family? And I said, this might be, seem very cliche and stuff, but why don't you just check if by chance they owned a restaurant? And she did. 
and she used to roll the silverware. And all she wanted to do was help. All that would have been my first guess that she worked at a restaurant when yeah. you told that story. Yeah. And, and yet, again, if people don't look deeper, if they don't think that there's a rational, reasonable reason, it's easy to categorize it and call for a pill. And would we want to be treated like that? Don't we want to be understood? And it, it can be so simple and so uplifting when you figure those things out, too. I mean, it makes everybody feel good. I and, know. And then that becomes contagious. And so I, I, I love, I, I just love the work that you guys are doing. Kathy, I want to throw this one to you. Um, how do you see the practice of becoming a CDCS help a professional as a whole, as well as family and people with dementia? How does your designation help everybody? What does it do for professional? Well, I think you know, we touched on that a little bit before, what it does for professionals, we think is it really helps to designate in a facility that yes person, someone who becomes that specialist, who knows inside out how to do exactly as you and Tammy just discussed, how to reframe a concept into becoming something like a reasonable reaction, rather than something you mentioned, which is corrective care. I love that term. I love that phrase, yeah. In regards to, I hate that term. Yep. If you know what I mean. Yes, yes. It's a beautiful way of putting it. And so, um, that's, that's the, the, for us, that's the, that's the gateway for uh, a long-term care community in regards to a professional is if they're working in community, they are that, that go-to person that understands the simplistic language inside and out and can help another staff member ease into reframing mm -hmm. and considering what are the possibilities creating possibilities, going through scenarios. And within the training, what we've done with these professionals is helped them then go back and work as a team. So they're not calling other team members out and going, oh, you did that totally wrong. When I learn in the CDCS program, not only in the CDCS program are we teaching them the, the, the techniques to use, but we're also teaching them how to promote this type of language in a positive way so that we are building teamwork. So we, one of my favorite improv rules is make your partner look good. And that's something that I love to drive into is that should be the mantra that we come from every single day. And so in professional settings, how are we making the resident look good? And how am I making my co-partners look good? Because if I can't do that, then I'm not doing anything productive. I love that because then you're really not part of a team. Not at all. Not at all. Um, in regards to personal, um, we talk about the Dementia Raw Method and Silver Dawn Training Institute and the CDCS program really as a lifestyle. It is not something that you turn on and turn off. Um, previous, I think, trainings and, and re you know, reality orientation or different, you know, you know we used to talk valid val validation therapy or not validation, um, therapeutic fibs. Those were things where, you know, when I was in the industry 20 years ago, we would tell a family member, you turn this part on when you walk in and work with mom, but then when you go back out in the world, you can remain and do your own thing. For us, the practice of improv and empathy and mashing all of these together becomes a lifestyle. And what that does is two things. It allows you the opportunity to practice it everywhere you go with everybody. And that means that you're strengthening your muscles with this practice constantly. Then when you enter into a situation and you're working with somebody who's living with dementia, it becomes, it's just a natural way of being. And it's not something that you have to stop and think, okay, how do I handle this? Oh, I have to use reality orientation. Oh, I have to give a therapeutic fib. The fact that you've used and lived in the mantra, make your partner look good the mantra, yes, and you've used that with your kids. You used it with your spouse. Now, when you go to visit mom, it's just a natural way of being. So for us, in regards to personal, it becomes a lifestyle. That's what we encourage. And then I think between Tammy and I, we use it with each other all the time. Everything that we teach, we live and do with each other all the time. I'll ask her, can you make me look good today? I need you to make my partner look good. Or she'll say to me, you did not yes and me in that situation. So it's a simplistic language. Yeah, that, we call each other out often. Yes, <laughs> but 
<laughs> instead of getting into an argument where we're trying to, we, we have this very simplified language and I know exactly what she means. Right. Yeah. She says, I didn't yes and her. I know exactly what I might've done wrong and I know how to correct that. And I don't take offense to it. That's, that's wonderful. And I think, I think families and organizations need this sense of team with, you know, because it, it is this corrective care or I have the right way or there's these perceptions out there. And I've always said, because I, I have the same belief of you, that dementia doesn't have to be complicated. You know, it can be really simple. And what's good for dementia is good for all of the world yes. and, and yeah. all of life. And you know, if we look at it like that, then it is attainable. It is doable. And I I love how you guys call one another out. And it's not a, it's not a go sit in the corner. You know, it's not a mean thing. It's just, hey, this is what I needed from you. And this is how we usually do it. And and not being afraid to say that. Yeah. 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 What's interesting about some of the, the terminology that we've used, and a lot of this comes from the improv world, they're neutral terms, so it's not a shaming term. So if I'm working with a coworker on the floor and I, I can use, you know, if I say, I, I just need to tap out, they get what I'm saying, they can go in, there's no shame, there's no judgment, it just neutralizes things. So I think we're able to, to talk in the shorthand, we're able to understand people really quickly, get the job done, and, and still maintain some really great connections with not only the person with dementia, but with our coworkers as well. Yeah. Well, and that tapping out, sometimes people are adding, you know, cause they're, they're just not in the moment. They got too much going on or they, they can't do it and tapping out or take teaming it, whatever you want to call just says you're up I'll yeah. be later. <laughs> just right. Yeah. I know I'm not the best person to be in this yeah. situation. And, and that's good. I want to ask you one question because I, I really am starting to dislike the word person-centered care. And I, I, I feel like it's overused and under-delivered. And I think it is a, it's always about somebody else and it's not about relationships. So I like using the word relationship-based yeah. care yeah. much better because it's not about just them. It's, it's about all of us interacting. And I, I just kind of wanted to get your, your thoughts on that. I'm seeing the heads nod on that. Um, <laughs> first. Well, it, it's interesting that you bring up that question right now because um, we do something on Wednesdays in our social media that's called Word Association Wednesday. So this past week, we put up the term person-centered. So we put up, a, we put up, I know, but wait, it's better because <laughs> So we just ask people to share their thoughts, you know, either give a word or a phrase about that concept. So this Wednesday is going to be relationship-centered care as our word association Wednesday. So I'm kind of glad you you put, brought that to our uh, this concept. I think person-centered care now has become a marketing mantra. Um, I, I may get shot later from... <laughs> oh, you're right. But, but it, I feel that it's become this marketing mantra that, that really is not truly at what the core of it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the more that I have lived and sat in and breathed what we have created with the improv rules and the empathy, it is more about creating that relationship. And especially for, our, for the people that we're caring for with dementia, it's all about how we connect with them. Absolutely, every day, 100%, it's all about how we're able to connect with them. Because once we're able to connect with them, we're able to communicate with them, we're able to help them with bathing and um, uh, activities of daily living, we're able to create something so positive for them to live and breathe in, right? Person-centered care definitely is something that if used correctly and, um, uh, what's the word, intentionally, has some benefits. And I think person-centered care actually uh, came from, um, I, ha- I know what the word is, it's not coming to me, but where it's u- where it was originally used and how it's kind of bridged over into this community has not worked out as well as I think it should have. Mm-hmm. So um, Kathy and I are 100%, 150% on team relationship-centered care or relationship-driven care. 
um, that's just my two quick cents on that. Well, and I think additionally, what the basis of improv is, again, taking out that myth that it's about comedy and understanding the basics of it, which is it's about building relationships. When you take an improv class, the, one of the first things you do when you get on the stage and you're with a partner, and you're, you're creating something out of nothing. The right. way that you do that is by establishing a relationship. Right. That's, right. that's the core of improv. You're not given a script. You have no idea what your partner is going to do or say. And right. so a lot of when we, when Tammy and I take improv classes, a lot of the scenes that go awry, go awry because the two partners on stage didn't establish a relationship together. Right. And that's what, you know, we're all drawn to relationships. That's, right. that's, that's a human instinct. We, we seek it on TV. We seek right. it in movies. We want to see it on the stage in theater and we can create it through imp- through those rules of improv. And so that's, we absolutely love relationship centered care because that's what improv is all based on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you find the, the most um, proficient caregivers out there are the ones that can create a relationship. And I know within this industry in the past, there's been a lot of talk about how you have to break yourself or disconnect yourself from, from the people you're working with. And I have never believed that. And I feel that the more that we can create that relationship, like Kathy said, it's all about the relationship. When we can create that, we're able to move mountains. Yeah. Well, like over in Australia and the UK, you hear them talk about that. I mean, they, you know, staff volunteer, they bring them to their homes. I mean, here that would be, ah, I know. It would just be, they're taking pictures, you know, because it's a friendship. Um, it is a true relationship, and I love the improv because you are building on one another, not tearing down or destroying, and a lot of times that's what we're doing is we're taking away instead of building up, so thank you for that. Um, what are some of the ways a person can dip a toe into your concept, Kat? So um, I'm going to say one of the best ways for them to dip their toe into our concepts is to get our book. Um, we published last year, it's a book called start with yes. And what we do in that book is it's a very well formatted book. So it's very easy to read. We've actually timed caregivers to read the book. Um, it should take somebody more than 50 minutes to complete the whole thing. And what we've done with start with yes, is we've tapped into two of the main rules of improv, two of them out of our four that we felt were the really good solid ones that we needed to start with. So in Start With Yes, we talk about relinquishing your agendas, and then we talk about the rule of yes and. And we felt that those two rules can give someone who has no education or or experience with this can definitely give them a good foothold as to how to start into this dementia raw process and start to create really meaningful communication with someone just with those two rules alone. So that's my push as the book. Now I know Tammy is the social media guru, so she probably has her own ways of doing that. I do. I do. And we actually have a free webinar series that starts on July 10th where they can start. um, It's going to be a series of four webinars where we're going to talk through, um, all of our concepts and share that with everyone. So it's absolutely free and we're, we're, we're experimenting with days. So it's going to be, there's a couple Tuesday, there's a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday in there. So we're, um, all the information is on our website to be able to get to those webinars. I would say the other thing that's, that's something that someone can dip their toe in that are two other free things that we do is also on our website. And Tammy, you can comment on this is one of them is the dementia perception challenges that we put out there. This is something that anybody can download for free access right away and start to step into what we truly call introspective care. So this is you truly stepping out of your comfort zone and trying some things on and then getting some real time feedback and realizing what the impact, the environment and us, what we have on someone who's trying to maintain and live with dementia. And then the other thing we have on our website is a free download called My Soul Purpose, which again is something that anybody can access. And what we really like about that is, is just like you mentioned, Lori, you know, it's really important to know people. You know, if if the person you're caring for worked at a restaurant and know that's that's 
an activity that brought her a lot of purpose, we need to know that kind of stuff. We need to excavate that because it will only help us provide that purpose in care later on rather than, like you said, starting into this, you know, tit for tat argument about someone picking up silverware. Mm -hmm. it, it will minimize, I think, those kinds of frustrations for staff because we're excavating and getting more information. Yeah, I love that. I'm so glad that you brought up the dementia challenge because um, I just think that those are so powerful uh, for people to go out. And I think they're shocked at the yes. reactions that they get. And it's it's like a virtual tour, except it's real. <laughs> and, and you're the lead. Um, and it, you know, being able to take in what's going in around you, I think that, that was just a, a brilliant, brilliant concept that you guys uh, thought of. Uh, anything else that you wanted to add on that note, Tammy? No, as always, Kathy thought of it all. Well, <laughs> darling, you're, you're the social media guru. Talk about our Facebook Lives. Oh, yes. I mean, our Facebook Live. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, just, I need to go and take a nap. This is what this is. Late <laughs> night list. <laughs> yeah, we do a Facebook Live every Tuesday. Um, during the summer, it's in the mornings at 10. Um, it's a range of things, us talking about our concepts. Um, sometimes we bring guests on. So it, it's, um, we talk for about maybe 15, 20 minutes and then everybody can go on their day. It stays on our Facebook and it goes on to our YouTube uh, channel as well. So I think the most fun Facebook lives tend to be the ones when I get to bring questions to Tammy that she doesn't know I'm going to ask. Yeah, she I does mean, it all the time. <laughs> Well, good. Um, I would like to, in, in wrapping up for each of you, just to pick one of your favorite pillars from empathy and your favorite improv rule and, and tell us why it's your favorite. And Kathy, I'll let you go ahead and start. Oh, I get to go first. So Tammy, sorry, you can't steal what I take. Okay. Oh, that's not fair. She oh. said our favorites. So our, they are favorite. Well, we love them all. That is for sure. And so for, what is your favorite? And I can so talk my favorite. So my favorite is actually one I struggle with, which is a strange, strange concept. But my favorite pillar is, uh, we call it working ourselves out of judgment. Mm. And that's something that I struggle with. I think we all struggle with, but I love this concept that judgment is hardwired in us. We can't avoid it. And to acknowledge that alleviates a lot of stress because we're pretty hard on ourselves daily. When we say, stay out of judgment, stay out of judgment. You're like, but I can't help myself. Um, to I learn, say that. Yeah. In our, in our class, we talk about the evolution and, and, and why judgment is something that's hardwired in our brains, why we go there instinctually, and then how you can work your way out of it. And people, we people see so many people have these aha moments in class when we talk about how you do that. So we put actionable steps into the pillars. And I love the actionable step we have with working your way out of judgment. And for us, that means you create a compassionate story in place of the judgmental one you have rolling around in your head. So we have quite a few stories that we use to illustrate the point and people really start having some light bulbs go off over their heads when, when we talk about that. And, and interestingly, yes, I struggle with staying out of judgment and my daughter is my number one person to call me out on the carpet when I have not <laughs> created a compassionate story. She is the She's first so one to come at. She is very good at it. She's our youngest CDCS and she is so good at creating a compassionate story. So that practice alone, I, I love uh, in regards to my favorite rule of improv, for me, I love make your partner look good. I love it. It brings in the concept of staying out of judgment, working your way out of judgment again. But I just love the fact that th that phrase, it's four words, and it's a beautiful mantra that we should all be living in all the time. And I think that when communication goes awry or we have a disagreement with someone and we step away from a relationship frustrated, if we can reflect and go, did I make my partner look good? Nine times out of 10, we can go, nope, I didn't do that at all. And that's where the problem lies. And I think it's really insightful. So those are my two favorites out of the eight. Uh, but I do love them all. Gosh, and just with those two, how the world would be different if everybody embraced those two. I mean, you just look at this whirlwind crazo things that are going on right now, if we just embrace those two things, it would be huge. Tammy, how about, how about you? What are your favorites? So surprisingly, Kathy did not take my two. Okay. So 
I'm, I'm impressed with that. That's why we work so well together. <laughs> I would have to say we're very yin and yang, yet very much the same. It's kind of strange. But I would have to say when it comes to the pillars of empathy, my favorite one is absolutely perspective taking. That's the very first one. Um, that's, you know, I, I love our dementia challenges because it challenges you to take on a new perspective. And I, I think... I have always felt that once we can kind of change a per someone's perspective, then we can dump all this education into them because they're nice and open. They're, it's like this little flower that's opened up. We can dump the education in and they blossom even further. I don't know if that was a great analogy. That was good. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> As I thought about it, I'm like, I don't know. But, um, and then I would have to say, Always, 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 my number one improv role, if there was only one thing that I could share with anybody, anywhere, that will make a difference right away, it's the role of yes and. It's two simple words, yes, comma, and, dot, dot, dot. Yes means to be in agreement, and means to add something to it. And if you can learn that concept, and only that concept, it's going to change the way you communicate with everybody in your life. And that's it. Those are my two favorites. Wow. Well, this has just been really a fun conversation, which I knew it would be. And I, again, I can't wait until you come to uh, White Bear and do a class there. Uh, I just, uh, I'm really, really looking forward to that. We're looking uh, forward to seeing what Minnesota looks like in the middle of the summer. We've only yeah, got yeah. 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 Well, very, very cold. Yeah, hopefully we don't go to the other extreme because right now we've been like 100, 105 and humid. <laughs> and we've been that way too. So yeah. So hopefully we'll we'll get some nice weather when when you're here. Now I wanted to just ask you guys one last question because the, the aging industry is changing so dramatically out there. What demographic do you feel is underserved and how do you think you can build a bridge to to meet that need and Kathy I'm gonna throw that to you first so my my answer for that is I think the kids the the age you know 10 through 18 I think is very underserved in feeling educated enough having the confidence to do this um you know I grew up I grew up going to the nursing home frequently to visit grandparents. So I was never afraid of the older adult. Um, then when I entered into the industry, it was not, I, you know, no skin off my nose at all. It, was, it felt very natural. Um, I, I think we do ourselves, I think we do our families a disservice by not including our children in the visits, the conversations, the communication, the education. So for me, I'm very passionate about that. I think that children need to be exposed to this. I think they need to have be part of the conversation. I think they need to be feel free to be vulnerable in how they feel about what's going on. And I think that the way that we we teach the communication techniques with improv and empathy is accessible to them. And so this will create that continuity of care within a family organization that helps everybody work together. Um, so for me, it's the kids. That's, that's how I feel. Well, and I love that. And I also think it's just empowering to them to feel like they can be purposeful, that they can be long, that they add value because they do, they add so much value and they come up with um, interesting ways to deal with problems that us adults, it's, it's not in our box. You know, right, right. absolutely. No. Yeah. And so it's, it really expands. It, it expands not only the network of care, you know, the team, but it, but it expands that vantage point. And yeah. I think that's just brilliant. I work with a, I work with a woman who has Parkinson's um, very, she's just in the beginning stages of some dementia, but very, very mild at this point. And my family actually came over last night while I was caring for this, for this woman and had chocolate cake with her and they enjoy her. And, you know, I've become part of her family. She's become part of my family. And like, like we talked about before, you know, you can't separate the two. It's that care and that relationship builds when you bridge that family, those families together. So uh, my, my, uh, the woman I take care of, I'm going to call her Emma. Uh, Emma got new glasses and tried them on for us. I showed, I asked her if she would try them on and show my family what she looked like. And my daughter is like, girl, you are sassy with those glasses. And she got Emma laughing so hard. And she was 
my daughter was just being my daughter. She was just being 17. But Emma embraced that. You know, it didn't matter that the language was goofy and silly and teenagery. She loved the engagement of that. And I, I, I just, I'm so glad that my kids are willing to come and see mom and work with mom and work with Emma and, and be a part of that. Um, it really, it really fills me up. It really, really fills me up. Well, it's that authentic conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Often is missing. And even if the language is different, I mean, the, you, that bubble, that burst of energy <laughs> is undeniable and it's, it's readable to anybody at any level. You know, Absolutely. and and I think we forget so much about the nonverbals and our overall communication. We so much focus on the words, mm -hmm. and we're not we're not looking at everything else. So I, I uh, kudos to you and your family. And I I think that um, I mean I just saw that with my own mom, or even you know when my daughter would come to the nursing home, just the the effects. Everybody just kind of lit up, yeah. and and felt normal and one of the things that you mentioned was about your your family embracing what you're doing um one of the terms i use is family by choice i like that is, you know staff and people we can be family by choice it's not about Absolutely. taking over and taking away it's about adding to and i i just i love that term because i think everybody wants an expanded family we want expanded support we want to be able to give and receive and and family allows us to do that way. how about you tammy what, what is there an area that you see underserved in a way that you'd like to bridge that gap to yeah you know there's there's there is a a particular community that we're starting to see age that hasn't really aged beyond a certain point and that's really the the down syndrome community so the Down syndrome community um, are now living much longer. And with Down syndrome, there's a 100% chance after a certain age that you will get dementia. And what we're starting to see is we're starting to see a lot of caregivers for that population starting to come to us. To They want to get the education so that they're better able to create those relationships with, with, um, with their clients that do have Down syndrome. So that's something that I'm seeing that I'd like. Um, I know Kathy and I have talked extensively on how we're going to um, start creating content that is specific for that community. Um, but I think that um, naturally we've already had some caregivers take our CDCS class and it has helped them tremendously to be able to understand how to create those connections and to communicate and, and take that on. So. I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, that's on the future on the horizon for us to, to hopefully to create those, bridge that gap. Oh, I love that. I, I worked in that field for nine years um, before I got into real estate, 25 and then into this and near and dear to my heart. And there are so many people that need, need help in that area. And I, I hear people talk about it all the time and there's not a lot of resources. It's not something that is, is talked about, but have heavily, heavily needed out there. Yes. So now for people to get a, to get a hold of you, the easiest way is just to go to your website, dementiaraw.com. Um, That's the easiest way. Yeah. Okay. And then you have Facebook. They can just put in dementia raw as well. And then Instagram you're listed as Dementia Raw. You and got it. Is it okay to give out your phone number to them? Absolutely. Okay. 219-649-1732. That's 219-649-1732. And Tammy and Kathy, I can't thank you enough. This has just been a real enjoyable time to spend with you. And I can't wait to push out uh, to the world what you're doing because I think I love your approach. I, I love um, your uniqueness, the way that you're you're coming after this and and really adding value and having fun and um, teaching people that this isn't a doom and gloom. You know, this is this is just part of another stage of life, and we all better get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the, Thank what, you so much. We can't wait to be there in Minnesota. So we'll be there in August. So we can't wait to see you there. Wonderful. Well, we will list that on the site as well um, when we go and push this out. So again, thank you so much. You guys have a great week, okay?
Thank you so Thank much. You. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.